Hello, and welcome, everyone. I'm Rita Lucen, VP of Partnerships and Development. I've been with breastcancer.org for 11 years, and I'm also a 15-year breast cancer survivor myself. So thank you so much for being here with us today. We've got a terrific program in store for all of you. If you've ever wondered how doctors can and should get to know someone in their care, what is reasonable for you to expect and demand, how you can speak up and ask for help and more, then today's panel discussion is for you. You'll also hear tips on managing a cancer diagnosis and our experts hope for the future of care. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors. Our presenting sponsors, Healthline Media and Lilly Oncology. Our lead sponsor, Pfizer. Our collaborating sponsors, Merck, Hologic, the Center for Restorative Breast Surgery, Daiichi Sankyo, Genentech, Gilead Sciences, Novartis, CGen, and Vertex, and our networking sponsors, ASI, Independence Blue Cross, Blue Sky, Varus, and Holman Automotive. To all of our sponsors, we are grateful for your partnership and for all that you do to help people affected by breast cancer. I also want to give a very special thanks to our phenomenal panelists who met in person for a riveting discussion, which was filmed to share with all of you. Their collective message is one of encouragement and hope, as you'll soon see. The panel includes Dr. Marisa Weiss, founder and chief medical officer for breastcancer.org and director of breast radiation oncology and Director of Breast Health Outreach at Lankanall Medical Center. Shelley Buck, President of Riddle Hospital. Dr. Lola Fianju, Chief of Breast Surgery at Penn Medicine. Helen O. Dickens, Presidential Associate Professor of Surgery in the Perlman School of Medicine and Surgical Director of the Rena Rowan Breast Center at Abramson Cancer Center. Dr. Aru Arzu Ghani, Associate Program Director for the Hematology Oncology Training Program at Lankanall Medical Center, and with Megan Severs from Healthline as moderator. Following the panel, we'll hear from presenting sponsor Lilly Oncology on evolving and meeting the needs of patients over the past couple of years particularly due to the challenges brought on by the pandemic. If you have questions during the program, please submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, either with your name or anonymously. Dr. Weiss, our senior editor, Jamie DiPaolo, and a few other breastcancer.org staff members are on hand to help answer your questions and suggest resources that may be useful to you. I also wanna remind you that we will be sending a link to the recording of today's program to everyone who has registered. It's my pleasure to now introduce breastcancer.org founder and chief medical officer, Dr. Marisa Weiss. Thank you, Rita, and hello everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. The topics in today's program are so important to me and the whole team at breastcancer.org because we are all dedicated to helping each and every one of you live as long as possible with the best quality of life. But before we kick off this discussion, I just wanna take the moment to recognize what a difficult and exhausting time it's been. It's living through a global pandemic has created unimaginable challenges and obstacles. For the past couple of years, you've faced delayed diagnoses, treatment disruptions, and worsened social isolation. Too many of you have had to go through breast cancer alone. I've seen this firsthand in the hospital. 
and on breastcancer.org and the community, we see how what, what a challenge this has been. But despite these challenges, there have been opportunities to improve patient care during this time. And you'll hear about some of those advances in a bit. One thing we all know for sure, when you get access to the best expert information and support and couple that with innovation, you'll be much better able to make the best decisions for your life. These advances are needed now more than ever before. At breastcancer.org, we are dedicated to keeping you updated on the latest guidelines and research and providing you with the trusted information that you need. We launched a whole new breastcancer.org website in March to better serve you. And we're working hard on creating a new community platform to grow our peer support network. Today, we rolled out our newest audience survey to get to know you better. And all the lessons that we learned from you will shape our new program. So we'd love to get your input. You can take part in the brief survey by visiting breastcancer.org forward slash visitor survey, breastcancer.org forward slash visitor survey. Now, when it comes time to managing a breast cancer diagnosis and treatment, there are so many factors to juggle it is overwhelming. You know, I call myself the dual citizen doctor and patient. I've been there. I even had the best care possible and still it, there were major, major gaps. And each and every one of you deserves the absolute best care for your individual situation every step along the way. And I hope today's webinar helps you become more empowered in your care. As a quick reminder, you can share your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Thank you all again for joining us. We're going to start with a rapid fire round of answers. So I'll ask each of you, what does patient-centered care mean and what's been missing? Well, I can just start just by saying that what's been fascinating to me as a doctor taking care of patients for 30 years and having started breastcancer.org 22 years ago is that each person is unique, uh, and I think we're finally at a point in medicine where we can really, uh, where we really need to sort of recognize, understand, respect, and honor each individual, and we're able to customize their treatment plan in a way that we never could before. So that's very exciting to me. To echo what Dr. Weiss said, I think really understanding what brought a patient to the moment in time in which they walk into your clinic door. Uh, understanding the context in which their disease is experienced and their treatment is lived, um, that that doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I think too often we are afraid of asking about more sensitive topics like, is this too expensive for you? Is it hard for you to make these appointments? Are you afraid to talk to your children about cancer? Because it's uncomfortable and because frankly the structure of the healthcare system doesn't reward our spending time on those type of topics. But without answering them and without addressing them, we won't really know the, the seat in which this woman is sitting during her cancer journey. And so doing a better job of asking those hard questions, even when it's not reimbursed in terms of their time in clinic, and even if you don't necessarily have the best answers, is something that I think we're moving towards, um, but we could still do better. Yes, and I fully agree that customization of a plan for um, very unique healthcare needs is um, what's been so rewarding. Um, and I think there is um, three um, core points that we should not forget as physicians. Uh, one is uh, value. Um, the other one is so, uh, knowing the socioeconomic um, situation of the patient and the cultural differences. And I think if you take that in addition um, to everything else that you need to medically address, um, then you'll do a much better job taking care of the patient. Wow, what else can I add? I think um, I bring a little bit of a unique perspective to this question, being a registered nurse by training, as well as being a hospital administrator. I see it from a number of different angles and sides. So um, I couldn't agree more with what has already been said. You know, it's about meeting the patient where they are, identifying their needs, needs that we may not um, initially think are important, um, oftentimes because it's, it's not part of our repertoire, if you will. It's not part of you know, the services that we deliver, you know, the tried, true, traditional you know, structure that healthcare you know, has been founded and, and built upon. 
um, but understanding you know, what impacts their care or ability to receive care from those social, you know, economic you know, determinants to you know, social determinants, even to their level of trust in the healthcare system. So we have to ask those questions, we have to have that dialogue and those conversations. And if not us, we have to identify those individuals within the community that they do trust, that, they, that we can partner with and you know, have those conversations so that we can better understand how to meet the patient's needs so that we can meet them again where they are. I had learned after my own diagnosis that um, the best way to, to you know, initiate an appointment with each patient, if I've met them for the first time or if I've met them, um, if this is one of many meetings, is to say, how can I be most helpful to you today? Mm -hmm. And I stop and listen and then I get to find out what's most on their mind how they communicate, what's, what the burning question is, so we can address that right up front. That's really helpful so that we can then, then I know exactly what their needs are, what, I, what their biggest questions are, where to start. Um, and it's through that partnership that we um, can move forward in it. Breastcancer.org, I hope we're making more people better prepared to have that conversation to know exactly how to present themselves to speak up and let the doctors know who they are and what they need. I will also say that um, I often begin my encounters with patients just acknowledging that this sucks. Um, I will say, I am so sorry we're meeting these circumstances. Ideally, we'd be meeting at a soccer game for our kids or at a community event. And I am sorry that we're meeting in these circumstances. But I want you to know that on this journey, I will be here for you. Here is my cell phone number. Call me anytime. And um, just acknowledging, as she said, the loneliness people experience and that diagnosis, it's very much, you know, a party of one. Because even if you meet other people who also have breast cancer, their lives are different. Even if you have a wonderful partner, their lives are, they can love you, but they can't live your life. And so um, just acknowledging that this is a difficult situation to be in, and I wish you weren't here. Um, I think a lot of people don't even feel like they're allowed to grieve that their lives have changed forever. Right, and it's always great when doctors can pick up the phone and call another doctor and say, hey, I just saw you know, Jane and um, she's struggling with this, that, and the, the other. You should know that before you see her so that you're better prepared. And I have that great relationship with you, um, Arizu. You know, you've been, um, you know, I think the communication is between doctors and patients, but also between people on the team so that, that, that care can be coordinated and, um, that, and less fragmented so the patient spends less time telling the same things over and over again um, and so that she can conserve her precious time and energy to what she most needs to do, which is to you know, figure out how to overcome this big challenge in her life and hopefully get back to the life that she wants to be living. And that reflects both personal and systemic barriers to patient-centered care, right? That unfortunately, we don't necessarily have time in the middle of a clinic day to pick up the phone and call someone. But if you have a multidisciplinary clinic where your surgeons and your medical oncologists and your plastic surgeons and your rad onks are either physically present or at least able to talk to each other in real time, then you can leave with a plan, some vision of the future that doesn't leave you feeling uncertain. You know, I'm really excited about the fact that we are trying to kind of front load those type of, you know, consults now because it used to be that you met just with the surgeon and you thought that's it, but a lot of patients now need systemic therapy before surgery. Mm -hmm. And isn't it great to walk out of there having a sense of what your next six months to a year is gonna look like? And so, yeah, I think the communication is hugely important. We did actually some qualitative research that showed that patients frequently don't know who to call at any given mm -hmm. stage of treatment. They're not sure who the captain of the ship is at any given time. So I also use that language. I'm like, okay, during your surgery and kind of radiation, it's kind of a co-captainship between me and the radiation oncologist. But during systemic therapy, you're really working with medical oncologists. But if you have a problem, you can always call me. And so again, leaving that door of communication open is just so important. Absolutely, Thank absolutely. You. And I, I think that's a, that's a great segue to, to my next question. Um, so, you know, often we think of clinical trials as just one avenue for patient empowerment by providing the possibility of improving or extending someone's life. And for a time during the pandemic, you know, flexible accommodations were made to keep clinical trials going despite the circumstances. For instance, some people were able to visit local doctors for medication or assessments rather than having to travel to the study site, or they were able to consent to clinical trials virtually instead of needing to do it in person. So Dr. Weiss, what can we take away from this time period and what should patients be asking their doctors about making clinical trial participation easier 
if they work full time, if they have family caregiving responsibilities, um, or if they can't easily travel for some other reason. Well, I mean, participating in a clinical trial is really important. It is how you get the best care possible, and it's how we discover the next, the promise of tomorrow. Uh, and we know that it takes extra time and effort to participate in a clinical trial, and those people running the studies try to make things as convenient as possible for you when you come in for inpatient, you know, in-person visits. And there are now some visits that you can do by telemedicine, like part of the informed consent process as an example. And there's some clinical trials that are not about treatment, they're about quality of life. Like I have a clinical trial on chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, and a lot of the, what, what the trial participant does is fill out questionnaires uh, remotely. Uh, and so you know, there, there are all different ways of doing it. Now there's, there can be some costs involved with a clinical trial uh, participation, and it's good to talk to the social worker because there may be ways to cover those the costs, like for transportation, for childcare, uh, to for you know different ways to overcome the challenges, the barriers to participating in a clinical trial. One of the things that inspires me is the you know the reason why we have so many great treatments today is because of all the dedicated and determined people with breast cancer who did participate in clinical trials uh, in the past over decades and decades, which has really helped us get to where we are. And we know we can do so much better because only about 5% of people in this country participate in breast cancer clinical trials. And even those people are, are not very diverse. So we, there's still so much that we don't know about how best to take care of each person with breast cancer uh, that we need to know quickly um, in order to cure more people, in order to, to improve the quality of life of everyone. Um, and it's going to be more participation in clinical trials. You know, my husband is a um, doctor at Children's Hospital in hematology oncology, and you know, 90% of the people with leukemia participate mm. in clinical trials, which is why we have the miracles. So we need more miracles for people with breast cancer. So we need more participation in clinical trials, and we need more trials available for people to participate in. There's been renewed attention and increased accountability in recent years, but there's still so much work that can be done to address disparities. So Shelley, I was wondering, how are hospitals changing to reduce disparities on a systemic level? Well, I love that question simply because um, just within this last week, the American Hospital Association announced their health equity roadmap, which they are pushing out to all of the healthcare you know, hospitals and organizations across the country. And what this health equity roadmap does is it presents a charge, a challenge, a process, information, toolkit, resources to assist um, organizations to identify through surveys, um, through their own assessment, where they have opportunities to remove barriers, to open access, to address disparities you know, in healthcare and, and mm -hmm. in the effort to improve health equity and outcomes, right? And so um, just in April, they um, introduced this, um, this roadmap, this health equity roadmap, and, and are challenging hospitals to adopt it and bring it on. The, the thing that I love about the organization that I'm with, Mainline Health, we started this work years ago. We started looking at um, disparities in care, started analyzing you know, our outcomes amongst our populations, whether it is you know, gender, race, you know, um, um, age, I mean, any, anything like that. We just put it all out there and, and created dashboards to see where can we make improvements. And as a result of some of that, that work, we're seeing needs you know, in the areas of, I mean, you name it, 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 it was validating, we put it that way, that there, there are opportunities around um, access for telemedicine, right? Continuing to develop and grow that, and not just to provide it, but to ensure that populations and groups can actually access telemedicine. Because in some areas of, of the city, even here, there's no Wi-Fi capability, and so there's issues there. So I was really glad to hear that there's, there's dollars and funding coming to help you know, stand up additional you know, towers and networks so that people have access. And that was something that we discovered through the pandemic, especially when the schools closed, and not a, every child could open a laptop and participate in, in school, right? Mm -hmm. So that's getting fixed. But we saw some of the same things, providing um, support, resources, um, you could say coach or even a mentor, some of our you know, senior citizens. 
that don't know how to use tablets and, and navigate you know, the, the web and, and things like that. They don't know how to send text messages or receive text messages you know, from their providers or from organizations or anything like that. So partnering with um, agencies and organizations that are out there um, to send resources to assist. And resources could look a number of different ways. It, it, it could be a volunteer, it could be you know, a community health worker, it could be a number of different things. But sending um, resources out to these um, homes or to the long-term care facilities or again to partners in the community, it could be your church, it could be your civic group, it could be your social organization, to assist our seniors in learning how to utilize you know, um, uh, laptops and computers and Wi-Fi, access Wi-Fi, and just so that they can then transfer those skills to utilize telemedicine, right? And sometimes sitting next to them just to show them how to get on, you know, the, the internet and talk with their doctor or open their medical record to see the message that came from their doctor to say, okay, stop this medication, give me a call, we have to do that. So, so people need help you know, in that way, and, and healthcare organizations are going down that path, that are on that path in that journey, and are doing everything that they can um, to try to improve that access even more, whether it's through telemedicine, or as I said, like shoulder to shoulder you know, support and access through partnerships out in the community too. That's so great. great to hear just how far-reaching and multifaceted these efforts yeah. are. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. It is interesting to note that when innovation occurs, disparities widen. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely because those who already had access to top-of-the-line care get to take advantage of the new innovation, while those who were behind fall further behind. And so having a real awareness of the potential to exacerbate extent disparities whenever something is innovated upon, whether that's moving to 3D mammography, um, whether that's moving towards you know, home-based infusion services for chemotherapy, that actually the chances of making things kind of worse is actually really acute and something we need to be attuned to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Fayanju, what, what would you say are the key barriers to health equity that patients should be aware of as they're trying to get the best care possible? Um, for their breast cancer or any other medical condition they may be experiencing? So, you know, I think often people talk about patient mistrust, especially uh, on the part of certain um, ethnic minority groups in terms of how they view the healthcare system. And I would say that the burden really falls on us to earn their trust, frankly, that we need to prove ourselves to be trustworthy because their mistrust comes from a real fear rooted not only in the history of mistreatment of certain groups, but also in real time bias right now. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about how the average black person is treated when they walk into a hospital. A number of black people were not diagnosed with COVID early in the pandemic because people didn't believe them. They didn't believe that you could be living in the United States, never have traveled abroad and contract COVID even though we knew it was already in the United States. So that's all to say is that people's approach to the healthcare system are informed by the past, but also the present. And we can change the present even if we can't change the past. With regards to improving, you know, patients, what patients can do to advance their own healthcare experience, you know, one is, ironically, don't spend forever shopping for second, third, and fourth opinions. We were just talking about this. Um, you know, other places I've practiced uh, outside of the Northeast, where I'm from, I'm from New Jersey, so I, I love this area and this is my people. But that being said, um, I see so many people who have third, fourth, fifth opinions. Um, and I do worry that sometimes that leads to delays in care, um, as well as discoordination of care, because their slides are here, and their imaging is here, and they're getting opinions here and there. Finding someone you trust and who has good reviews and who you can get information about, use the networks that are available to you to find out who you can go to. It doesn't necessarily have to be about who's famous. It's about who sees you as a person who has good outcomes. Um, I think one thing we can do as a healthcare system is do a better job at publishing those outcomes. We already do that a lot in cardiothoracic surgery, but less so in um, oncology. Um, so I would say, you know, shopping around, you know, being informed, but not necessarily spending forever trying to forestall treatment and the sake of trying to find the perfect provider. Um, I would say, two, um, coming in and asking the questions you want to have. Have your list, have your family with you. If they can't be there in person with you, have them on the phone. I would also say that uh, you know, just being willing to ask for more information um, and to hold accountable your providers if they're not providing you the information that you think you need. Many people who don't participate in clinical trials from ethnic minoritized groups will say that no one asked them. 
And so one of the things you can do is just say, hey, I'm interested in clinical trials. I'm not saying I'm going to participate, but please let me know about them, because I know that by virtue of just being observed as part of a clinical trial cohort, I am likely to get higher quality care. So I think those are some strategies patients can use is, you know, shop around, but you know, don't do that to an excess. Ask the questions you want to ask. Bring a friend who can help you consume that information and process it. And then finally, you know, put yourself out there, someone who's open to clinical trials because it could potentially give you um, a higher quality of care and greater observation. You mentioned, you know, bringing a list of questions to ask. And I, I was wondering, do you have any suggestions for people who maybe don't, don't know what to ask? How, how do people come up with those questions? How do they know that they're asking the right questions to get the information that's going to help them the most? That's really hard. I mean, so I personally um, start off and say to every person I meet, you know, I'm assuming you're a smart person learning the new language of breast cancer. So we're going to go back to the basics. And I do drawings, and I explain everything like that. And then I never ask, do you have questions? I say, what questions do you have? Because almost everyone has them. Mm -hmm. So bring your questions. In terms of the things that I think are important, I think it's important to know, um, you know if they can give you a timeline in terms of a projection of what the next several six months to a year will look like. Um, I think you should ask about the extent to which their communication with you will happen during the day or outside of business hours. I only say that because many women work the kinds of jobs where they can't answer their phone during the day. Um, and we're increasingly realizing that we need to move towards strategies that recognize the diversity of socioeconomic status amongst our patients. People who work on factory floors, people who work on medical floors often are not allowed to use their phone. They will be penalized if they use it. So are we thinking about how to make sure those women get the messages that matter to them during the day and are not penalized as being non-compliant or difficult to reach. Um, other questions that I think are important to ask are, you know, what can I expect at home in terms of the help that I will need? Because a lot of people, you know, have the superwoman approach, you know, um, they're just gonna push on through. And I think asking, you know, will I be able to lift things? For how long will I not be able to lift things? What kind of help should I be asking for and do you have it available at the center? And then finally, exploring, what I would ask patients to think about is, you know, how can I get evidence-based care and how can I bring to you questions about alternative therapies in a way that will not be judged? Because a lot of patients do come saying, well, there's this vitamin, there's this, you know, probiotic, there's this and that. And what I always tell people is, look, that may have some efficacy. We do not know. I am agnostic as to the efficacy of this particular treatment. I come from a culture where I'm sure there are things that have been used that are helpful that never made it into clinical trials. However, based on the evidence we have today, this is what we know works and to what extent it works. So I'm going to recommend that to you. And it's not that I'm minimizing or disrespecting your approach to care, but it needs to be as part of an evidence-based regimen. So I would say that things they should ask about are, you know, what is my next year going to look like? How can I get the help that I need for the things that may make it difficult for me to get to care? And then finally, you know, can I come to you with questions that you might sound, think sound kooky, but I know that you'll actually give me information and trust me, and, um, and I can trust you uh, to, to get the right information and to be led in the right direction. That's great. And anyway, at breastcancer.org, you know, we, have, we provide a lot of support in that arena, like help, helping people prepare for each doctor's visit. And then in the community, where, where people help each other, they will, you know, depending on their situation, they'll give them a list of questions and they'll, they'll let them know what was helpful to them and just help them feel more confident and more fluent, you know, know, know the language better, like you said, it's a whole foreign language, so that when they do get into the hot seat, they feel a bit, little bit more informed and confident about speaking up and feeling entitled to the doctor's time and attention and, and for the doctor to earn their trust and not just assume it. And I actually give patients a list of websites, breastcancer.org being one of them, mm -hmm. at the end of the visit saying, look, I know that we've just thrown a lot of information at you and this might be hard to process. Here are websites I trust in the midst of the plethora of unreliable information that's out there on the internet. I always say, look, I'm not saying that there aren't things outside of this list that might be reliable, but I know this list is reliable and breastcancer.org is on that list because it's a really good source of clear, relatable information. Thank you. You both touched on this brief, like a little bit, but um, I, I would like to expand on it a little bit and then also open this question up to, to all the panelists. What can people do to recognize and take control of things that may impact their care, like simply being listened to? What can people do when they sense that their healthcare providers may possess implicit bias, which is when someone's point of view, like a doctor's decision, is shaped by stereotypes or prejudices that they may not even realize that they are acting on? I can take that one to start. Um, I think people need to 
recognize that they have and, and firmly believe that they have a right to care, right? They, they have a human basic right to receive care, right? And within that right, you should be, expect to be listened to, respected, have your questions answered, um, and be given the time, right, to, to have that dialogue and, and to build the trust, right? Because trust shouldn't be assumed. I think, as you said, Dr. Weiss, trust isn't you know, assumed because you walk in you know, the door and you're, you're here to see a physician or, or, or a provider or anybody, right? Reassuring you know, people that it is OK to ask the questions, that it's OK to bring advocates you know, for support, because you know, you're going through a very difficult time. Right? And, and there, there's a mental component to it, as well as the physical component. And so individuals, um, women, definitely need you know, that support. So bring your support systems with you. And there's obviously a, a number of different um, um, tools and resources on, on breastcancer.org's web, website and in the community, as, as we've talked about um, already here. But also, stand up for yourself and, and refuse to take anything less. If you're not getting the care that you deserve, that you feel you deserve, right, go to that next provider. But don't settle for suboptimal care. There's no reason in today's world why any woman should not receive a mammogram. There, there's, there's no reason, right? Every woman in Philadelphia should have access to a mammogram, whether they can pay or not, right? There, there's no reason. In my organization, we believe that, right? But as women, we have to believe that. We have to believe we have that right, that, we, that we're entitled to that level of care and then take charge. And that's, diff that's easy to say, right? But it's also, I can understand, difficult to do. You know, being you know, an African-American female, I've experienced the biases and I've experienced being ignored and not listened to and having you know, the, the judgments and, and things like that. Um, and then, you know, you, you, there's, there's ways to navigate it. it. It could be a frank conversation, or you could pivot and find somebody that you're more comfortable with. Or again, you bring an advocate to help you walk through those conversations, right? But it in, is indeed, I think, a right for every person to receive care, and especially for women to receive care. Absolutely. I mean, breast cancer is the most common cancer to affect mm -hmm. women, yeah. and it affects us in the prime of our lives. And just look around the room. It's not just you know, we don't just count the 265,000 or so new cases in the United States. When you start thinking about all their family and friends and everyone who depends on them, it's millions more who are affected. And uh, we have to apply all those, uh, all the, 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 the skills we have that run our lives and everyone else's lives and take care of everybody else. We have to sort of like refocus and reframe and start and realize, whoa, whoa, my life right now is, you know, is being challenged and I need to take care of my greatest gift, which is my life, and I need to find people that I trust that have the skills and who respect me to have the, and give them the honor of being part of my team. Right. Right. Yeah, I, love, I love that everyone's saying, you know, talking about your rights and, and respect and empowerment. And I, I hope that if everybody can just leave with one thing to, think, to keep in mind uh, after tonight, I hope that it's, it's keeping those ideas in the back of their mind. Thank you. So the challenges we're talking about, access to treatment, health equity, and living through the threat of COVID-19, they've all taken a toll on everyone's mental health, which everyone is, has definitely touched on tonight already. Dr. Ghani, what is being done now to address the whole patient and to offer care for anxiety and depression during and after breast cancer treatment? Yeah, so we talked about COVID-19 and how that really this past two years, not only isolated patients, but also um, truly delayed care and um, delayed diagnosis, um, which has had an enormous impact on the mental um, health of patients. Also, unfortunately, unproportionally, it affected the um, patient population that is um, um, you know, the underserved population. Um, so they were mostly affected. So all that really has created a vicious cycle of having, um, you know, impact on your um, uh, mental well-being, 
which then further again delayed the, the whole um, diagnosis and, and the care that they needed. So I think it's very important as a physician to just um, address this issue. Um, you know, I, I feel when patients come to me, if, I, if, if we build trust that they actually talk to you about um, their emotional well-being, they open up um, most of the time and um, also ask for help. There are some tools I have incorporated in, in, in our practice. Um, I do like to give a questionnaire to patients when, um, when they come for their initial visit as, as well as for their follow-up. So if there is a person who's not really liking to talk about it, at least if they put it on paper, you have another chance of capturing the problem and, um, and then rediscussing that during the visit. Another um, tool that I think has been helpful uh, for us um, is having um, the body system there where uh, you create this peer-to-peer -peer connection so patients um, really like to talk to other patients with the same problem. It helps enormously to nurture that and, and sometimes it remains a lifelong um, friendship and, and help. And at a, you know, at a, at a hospital-based system, we are trained to ask and we always need to ask, do you feel safe at home? Because I think during the pandemic and women, you know, people's lives, we have a lot of secrets. And there is, there, you know, people have suffered through domestic violence, which has gotten worse through the pandemic. So it's always important to ask your patient when they're on their own, like, because if you, if someone comes together to see you with a group of people, uh, you know, you've got to still have to find the time where you can be one on one with them and say to them, you know, do you feel safe at home? Do you feel is there anything going on at home that you want to share with me? That um, to make sure that you know you are we're, we're protecting and cherishing your life um, there and and here. So I think that we, we that needs to continue and even be more thoughtful, so that we don't miss the opportunity to keep the people we take care of safe um, wherever they are. I would argue that um, that type of screening needs to be systematized in order to make sure it's not just reliant on the empathy and thoughtfulness of individuals like mm -hmm. you. You know. Emergency medicine has actually been very much at the forefront of medicine in terms of the screening for intimate partner violence. That is something that's asked, I think, of basically every person who walks in the door. But it is not necessarily part of every oncologic consultation, even though ideally it would be. And so, um, you know, at Penn, we do have um, a screen that's performed by our nursing staff on intake such that if people then reach a certain threshold, we are prompted as clinicians to um, administer formally the PHS-9, which is a patient report outcome metric that specifically looks at depression. There is the opportunity to implement patient report outcome measures into clinical care that has had more um, sporadic uptake throughout the country, but there are a lot of forms, including, as I mentioned, the PHS-9 or the NCCN, the stress thermometer, which can be a way for patients to report not only how stressed they feel on a given day, but what things are contributing to their stress, such as difficulty with childcare, pain, fatigue, spiritual concerns, difficulty with transportation. So that can help us kind of start to troubleshoot as to whether or not some of the things that they're dealing with can potentially be intervened upon and ameliorated. So um, I think ultimately we need to do a better job at making our systems work for the patients in this way because we can't just rely on the good providers. Like there are good providers everywhere, but it's hard to keep all those things in your head at any given time. And you may forget to ask someone who really needs to be asked. So if we can do a better job, you know, a lot of the EMRs have electronic medical record systems, have these flow sheets. They just need to be implemented and kind of routinized into clinical care. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know how it work, in the work environment, there's like this saying like, okay, I'll take on another task, but then you have to take a task away, right? Because my plate is already full. Mm -hmm. When I think about the patients that we take care of, their, pa their plates are already full when they come in and they've got a brand new job they never wanted, which is to become the full-time you know, patient mm -hmm. in some cases, or at least you know, a heavy part-time or unpredictable schedule of this new job that they have. And so it's important to take some things off your plate when you're diagnosed with breast cancer so that you can have the time, attention, and focus to, you know, to, to, and to put on the, your, your situation 
while still getting the sleep that you need and making sure the house doesn't burn down and the kids are wearing clothes when they go to school. So my, I have a nurse that sits down with people and says, you're going to have to delegate or ask for help. And she says, make a list right now what you're going to delegate and ask for help. Because you just, if you give a woman something extra to do, she's going to try to figure out how to do it. But she, we're not that good at delegating and asking for help. So just giving, getting permission and making that sort of a doctor's order kind of thing or just an expectation, that's also very helpful. Some colleagues and I published a paper um, in Cancer a couple of years, about a year ago, that specifically looked at um, the NCCN distress thermometer, this patient report outcome measure, where you can report on a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being no distress, 10 being extreme distress, what your score is, and then identify stressors. And at my previous institution, if you had a score of four, that was automatic trigger to social services re for referral. And what we found was that African-American women were the only group for whom the median score was three. So just below the threshold for automatic referral, even though they reported as many stressors as women of other groups. And so that led us to be concerned, well, is this part of what some people have described as a superwoman phenomenon? That is. This is just one more thing to bear in a life and where I'm already bearing a lot of things, but it doesn't mean I don't need help. Just how do I ask for it? So that's all to say is that even in things that are very highly validated, instruments that have been tested in millions of people, we may still have gaps in terms of identifying those who really need help and who may be unable to ask for it. So again, systems help, empathetic providers help, but we need both in order to really help patients who um, are at risk for disparate care. And I would say leading by example. You know, I think that that helps. I know you, know, you run a hospital, mm -hmm. uh, Shelley. You know, it, it helps when you have your your um, your leaders. You know, conduct themselves in a way that uh, the the other new tra doctors in training and other people, you know, learn from them and set the example. And I love what you what you said. You know, systematize. You know, some of the assessments. I mean, so we have electronic medical records. You know, all of our organizations, at least here in the region, you know, work towards standardizing processes of care because, you know, they're evidence-based, they're measurable, you can, you know, predict, if not, you know, drive to a certain outcome. Um, and then not only the research piece that you can then either overlay or build out of some of that standardization um, to continuously make it better as you go along. And so I think that's very important that we make sure that we are walking the talk, right? Yeah. Um, not only for our patients and, and even the visitors that will come in and, and observe and one day need to access you know, our care, but also for our employees and, and our staff. Right, and it's also, you know, it's important when you're working in a group of people and you're doing hard work that the leader of the team has, is, is, loves what they do, is energetic about it, and is gonna be more excited by new, new advances that are coming down the pike. And, and if you're in medicine, you're basically you're always a student and you always have to be in the mode of being um, accountable for what you, what you did or said or didn't do and, or, and get credit for what you did do that was great. And also learn new, new, tr new things so that you can do a better job as medicine marches forward. And I know that Dr. Uh, Ghani, um, you're training the, you are so involved in training the next generation of oncologists. So you've got your, 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 you live that commitment every day. It is definitely quite a challenge to stay up to date, um, but it's definitely a positive thing that's happening. Um, just alone, one area of breast cancer, how much is happening and all the um, new treatments um, that are coming, you know, daily and changing daily and keeping up with, the, with that is certainly challenging as a physician, but um, so rewarding to experience it and seeing patients you know, moving from staying alive with one treatment until the next treatment is approved. And you can even with advanced stages of cancer, um, see them achieve their goals in life and see their children um, graduate and um, they make it to the wedding and, and the next stages. So. Um, we're just so lucky to be able to be part of that. No, I tell my patients all the time, despite being a surgeon, um, that it really is the advances in systemic therapy that have revolutionized breast cancer and allowed us to be better surgeons. And so uh, it is hard keeping up with all the latest uh, therapy that comes down the pike, but 
you know, with the exception of pediatric malignancies, where I agree clinical trials are mm -hmm. kind of the rigueur, you know, what everyone does, breast cancer, at least amongst adult malignancies, is by far the most evidence-driven. You know, we rival cardiology in terms of other fields that have a really real commitment to clinical trials as driving our, our mode of care. And so, you know, I feel very proud to be part of our community because we are so evidence-oriented and committed to lifting as we rise. You know, that is everyone who is part of their cancer journey, you can help the next person by virtue of being part of a trial. So mm -hmm. um, it really is a privilege and it makes it easy to teach. You know, I have to make a pitch for the non-breast cancers out there because I feel like we actually are benefit from a lot of publicity and in a fairly privileged space. You know, it's a lot harder to convince people to get excited about colorectal cancer. You know, that being said, I, I feel very grateful to be part of the breast cancer community because we do have an audience and a very committed group of people who want to work towards uh, improving care. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, it, so not only does breast cancer get a lot of attention, which I think it deserves, we all agree it deserves, I know it's, it's the most common cancer to affect women. It affects them in the prime of their lives. Uh, you know, but it's also true that um, just skipping over to you know, women, these the sort of the superwoman approach to life that all of us are sort of working, you know, tirelessly at home, at work, in the community, um, and we, we're so good at getting it all done that so many women are actually do, are, are really doing it alone because the people around them look at them and they think, oh, she, you know, she can handle anything. Look at she's already handled. She can handle this. She handled can handle anything. But the reality is, is that even if she can handle everything, um, she may not yet have learned how to ask you for help. And it, it, you know, I, I, as I said, I sh shared, I went through breast cancer 12 years ago, and my husband would come up and poke his head in the door when I was recovering from surgery and say, do you need anything? And what he should have done was sort of like, someone should have told him, bring the fruit salad and the drinks and the, you know, and the this and the that, Make, fill the tray and just bring it in. Because I couldn't learn overnight how to start asking for the things that I wanted because you know, it, it, just, it was too fast a uh, learning curve to get up on after having been through surgery and everything else. So, um, but it was the people around me, my sisters, the, 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 the village that um, sort of jumped in and my team at breastcancer.org were absolutely indispensable at sort of helping me manage my own care and as, as well as all the communications because you know, you've got people are part of communities at work, they're part of communities at church, in their community, and they wanna be able to control the information that, that is shared because it's your, your private information that you, it's, as I say to my patients, it's your news to share, not ours. Mm -hmm. You can ask people to help you do that, but you can create the message that you give to your, your network that you have authorized them to share, the talking points, as it were. And that's another thing at breastcancer.org in our community where people help with, with each other, and that's one of the things that they can help you with. We could spend the whole night talking, <laughs> talking about this subject yeah. alone. Uh, but we are, we are nearing the end of our evening, um, so I did want to end with a two-part question for each of you. So is there an innovation on the horizon for detecting or treating cancer that most excites you right now? And part two of the question is, what gives you hope for the future of patient-centered care? I will go back to my first point, which is that we're really at a time where there's no one size fits all, and that we have the opportunity to help each individual patient to really sort of, you know, get to know her, respect her, understand her unique situation so that she can take advantage of all these great discoveries that we now have available, and then to, you know, to sustain her through, and ask her how we can be as helpful as we can through, through that time. And I'm, you know, honored at breastcancer.org that you know, who comes to us every day, every night? It's those people who got the call. Yesterday was a normal day, but today they got a call from the, that they found out that their mammogram shows a spot. And, you know, if you think about all the people out there who had an abnormal mammogram, you know, most of the time it's going to turn out to be okay. But for the period of time that they were worried up all night, they all thought they had it, they were going to die from it. And for those people who actually have it, uh, no matter what your situation is, um, I'm inspired by the fact that we have many more opportunities today to protect and cherish people's lives. And I'm excited with our new website, breastcancer.org, that we can do a better job um, at giving each person that information. And then learning from the people we take care of through a new world of research that can make things better in the future. And the chance to work with great people like who are my colleagues on the stage tonight. I would say there are two advances that I think 
uh, I'm really excited about, and I think we're on the cusp of getting right. So one is kind of more social. So um, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has really shone a light on the extent to which social determinants of health, such as access to housing, income, can impact the care journey for people. Um, and we saw the outsized effect that COVID-19 had on people who already had various kind of um, social limitations. And so I think there's a lot of excitement and a lot of interest in doing a better job at collecting that data. Um, we have the fields in our medical records to collect it, but the rates of missingness are very high. But a lot of us who work in the area of health disparities are working hard to try and do a better job at collecting that data and acting upon it. So moving from just describing disparities to redressing them. So that's a really exciting thing that I think ironically has been really kind of highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The second more clinical is that because we're having such excellent systemic therapy, we're moving towards a world where we can do less bad surgery. And by bad surgery, I specifically mean the kind of surgery that leaves them with life-limiting sequelae, such as lymphedema. So we're moving towards a world where systemic therapy can be so good that we can render someone's axilla or their underarm cancer-free from medication alone, and therefore they can forego extensive and highly morbid local regional therapy, including axillary lymph node dissections and axillary radiation. So that is really exciting to me, the fact that we no longer have to worry about women having compression sleeves, um, that we can even have some women who would have needed a mastectomy for, who are now called super responders, who may not need surgery at all. That is actually the next frontier. And people say, well, why are you excited about doing less surgery? I'm like, there are always gonna be still jobs for us. But I think if we can get to a point where women are not getting the kinds of things that leave them really feeling unable to accomplish the regular you know, activities of daily living because of treatment, then we've really made a huge step forward. Um, in terms of what gives me hope, I would say, you know, I feel like the children will save us. You know, I, I'm, um, I'm pre-millennial, um, but uh, I do feel like I learned so much from the residents and medical students that I mentor um, every day. Um, in terms of just thinking about how to approach our patients with kindness and thoughtfulness, but also how to be better providers ourselves by taking care of ourselves. You know, the COVID-19 has been very hard on everyone. And in our healthcare systems, we often pay insufficient attention to the people who are critical to that system but aren't technically clinicians. Our housekeepers, our administrative assistants, the people who are you know, our greeters, they're suffering too, and they're not getting the attention, the applause that many clinicians do. So I think that honestly, the next generation has helped us be more outward looking in terms of what it means to be a healthcare system, what it means to be citizens in an increasingly global world. Um, and I think they're gonna make us practice better medicine. Yeah, so I can expand a little bit on what you already said of, um, about the clinical advances and um, we can talk all night about what's exciting us because there is so many things that's exciting us um, on the clinical part. You mentioned less surgery. Um, I think um, in the uh, medical oncology world, um, what's been phenomenal seeing the, having the capability of escalating and de-escalating therapy has been a phenomenal change. More, more and more for the aggressive subtypes of breast cancer, we have started giving um, medical therapy first and then basically studying what the cancer cells are doing, what, how is the treatment really affecting the, the biology of this cancer. And that has directed us then further what to, what to do with, um, with the treatment after the patient has had her, uh, her surgery. So much of treatment patterns have changed. Um, we have more and more targeted drugs available. That means medications that attack the cancer cell and just kill the cell without really um, affecting the, the healthy cells in the body. And those medications are used in the advanced stages of cancer. Um, and now we're investigating to bring them more in the, in the curative setting and um, increasing survival and decreasing um, relapse of the cancer. And then what's also phenomenal is seeing that the subtypes of breast cancer are actually expanding. You know, right now we talk a lot about hormone receptor positive cancer. 
Uh, we talk about HER2 positive cancer, uh, which um, expresses this HER2 protein, and then we have the triple negative cancers that have no hormone receptors and no um, HER2 expression. And we are, we are identifying that there is probably a lot more to this. Um, for example, the HER2 spectrum, if there is a little bit of expression of the HER2, there are um, medications that can um, address that um, unique um, part of the HER2-driven um, uh, cancers. So there is so much uh, more um, to come, and um, it's really exciting to be able to offer the, all these uh, to patients. And again, I want to just like you all encourage patients to get enrolled on clinical trials because that, that is truly the best care you can get. So it's oh, wonderful. I would say, um, what gets me excited? about where we are is that for years we've always talked about addressing disparities in care and achieving health equity and kind of like flattening the landscape, if you will, so that everyone has access and are treated you know, equally and fairly. And there's been lots of discussions, but there hasn't been as much movement as what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. And we now have you know, very clearly defined strategies, tools, again, roadmaps, resources that healthcare organizations can tap into to start creating the environment and the culture that um, opens access for all people, right? So that everybody can be seen, can be heard, can receive care. And again, and I'll use the term that I, I, I've been using for years, um, we, we can meet them exactly where they are so that we can optimize their outcome and their experiences. What gives me hope are nights like tonight, where we can sit and we can talk and have honest, open discussion and dialogue about not only you know, the treatment that we provide, we can have experts you know, here that are delivering the care, um, think of innovative solutions you know, to get communication, information, education out to millions of people, and to have you know, an audience here, as well as you know, on you know, the, the internet watching and listening, knowing that this is all done in an effort to help not just one person, but many people. And that gives me a lot of hope. Hi, I'm Dr. Stacy Moeller, a global development lead that supports breast cancer research at Lilly. Before I came to Lilly, I spent more than 20 years as a medical oncologist with an exclusive focus on breast cancer. I'm energized at the way breast cancer treatments and support have improved over that time and where the, these advancements are heading. And on behalf of Lilly, I'm excited to be a part of this event focused on recent innovations that will help shape the future of care. The pandemic has impacted every one of us differently, but universally it highlighted the importance of connection and in the process challenged the entire healthcare system to stretch and innovate patient-centered care. One of the ways Lilly has done this is to meet people where they are. Inspired by blood mobiles, Lilly converts RVs into research units to reach elderly patients through a first of its kind COVID-19 trial. This patient-centric and mobile initiative was so successful, we expanded it to provide access to care and clinical trials. By bringing research directly into a variety of communities, we are helping more patients access the best treatment options. Our mobile units are just one example of how Lilly has accelerated our efforts to diversify clinical trials by making participation easier and more convenient. Increasing diversity across everyone involved in the research process, like patients, caregivers, advocates, healthcare providers, and scientists, helps advance breast cancer treatment for everyone. This commitment to a patient-centered future of healthcare is why we are so proud to partner with breastcancer.org. The resources they provide underscore their dedication to meet people diagnosed with breast cancer where they are with accessible information and connection. On behalf of everyone at Lilly, many of whom have been touched by cancer in some way, I want to thank you for the partnership, your inspiration, and the opportunity to make a difference together.